Good morning, Rob. Morning, Jeff. How you doing, brother? Frozen. Yeah. <laughs> Old. It's a little cold outside. Tired. Isn't it amazing, man? <laughs> like, I feel like such a wimp. Yeah. So I don't know. I passed like 45, and since then, oh, if it drops beneath, you know, 35 degrees, uh, I'm like a baby. I'm just like, oh, freezing cold. Yeah, I'm. I'm with you. If my insides just seem to n- rebel against cold weather what is it right now it's like teens right i don't know feels like negative 117 I think, I think it's something teen which is too <laughs> too low i'm going to florida on vacation in march so looking forward to that something to look forward to yes. and uh, also Indeed. june will come that's true eventually <laughs> eventually feels like a long way away but looking forward to it it's good i'm excited to be here today me too man me too we have a good topic to talk about today uh the, the title or the topic is Hearts Ready for the King's Return. Mm. Uh, we are living in troubling times. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, we're living in troubling times. I stick my head in the sand. Yeah, try not it'll, to notice. Just it'll, whistle it'll, past the graveyard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wish I could do that better. I, I'm too aware. I'm hyper, hyper vigilant, like my German shepherd. I'm hyper vigilant. Nevertheless, I know. To one degree or another, we're all aware of how things feel in the world right now, in our country right now. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask me recently, hey, do you think we're near the end? And, you know, in my gut, it's like, okay, it feels like it's near the end. I, I have uh, I have non-believing friends, non-church-going friends who feel like, oh, man, we got to be close to the end. I, I got a comedian buddy who says, uh, at this point, I'm rooting for the aliens, man. We're, we're done here. Like, he's just so <laughs> fed up with humanity. Uh, we're done here. So all that to say, from a believing standpoint, and we know that some point in the future, Jesus is coming back. That's one of our great hopes mm. and something we are thankful for and eagerly anticipating. So here we are, lots of things going on that we tend to be anxious about or stress about or feel like, oh, man, is he coming? And usually it's because of the the news items we see that are so alarming, you know, and there's so many of them, whether it's, you know, the conflicts out there, the Israel uh, battles going on in that part of the world, the Ukraine-Russia conflict that's been going on and on, and the uh, very heated political debates, and it's 2024, it's election year, and so... Nothing weird will happen this no, year. No, it's going to be super normal, I'm sure, right? <laughs> yeah, so there's that. All to say... Lots of things, right? Lots of things that we're all thinking about, processing, and and concerned about. And for believers, again, it makes us we can't help but think of the end. And is this is this we're coming to the end of all things? Well, interestingly, your sermon last Sunday dealt with the triumphal entry of Jesus, the the, the sort of coronation of of King Jesus during his earthly ministry. This amazing scene where. People are hailing him as king, at least for a short period of time. And so I thought maybe that would be a good opportunity for us to talk about what it looks like to have hearts prepared for the king's arrival, his second coming. Um, and maybe one way to do that would be to ask first the question, okay, what what does it not look like? And we get some examples of that, even with the context of the triumphal entry, and then we'll talk about, okay, what, what does it look like so that so that we can be prepared for whether that's coming in the next day, week, month, which I think we'd all say we'd be great with that idea. We'd love that. Or if it's 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years away, which we can't know for sure. So either way, um, let's talk about what it doesn't look like and what it does look like. So in light of your message last Sunday, which I'm sure is still somewhat fresh on your mind, uh, what was it about that scene, what do we see there in terms of what the people were expecting and wanting with regard to their view of the Messiah's first coming? What, where were there some blinders or some misunderstandings? Well, I, I think that th- what they were looking for was rooted in some ways in what the promises of the Old Testament were relating, which is that this Messiah was going to come and he was going to bring peace and righteousness and justice to Israel, that those opposing forces outside would be set aside, and the wars that were breaking out among them and around them, kind of circling around them, all those wars were going to be subdued, 
and there would be a kingdom of prosperity and peace and uh, righteousness that would endure. So like that, their expectations were kind of were related to the promises that were articulated in the text of the Old Testament. It wasn't uncommon or unnatural for them to have some of those perceptions. Now, I think that we could, as we talk about what they were actually mm-hmm. looking for, see that it was very self-oriented as opposed to seeing a bigger picture oriented. But for for now, I, I, I think that it's important for us to think it's not unnatural, it's not uncommon for them to view the coming of the Messiah in terms of him ushering in peace, righteousness, and justice. For instance, John the Baptist heralding the that the Messiah was coming. He called people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. His expectation was that Jesus was going to bring in this righteousness and peace that was promised, and he ended up in prison. And while he languished there in prison, he wondered, maybe maybe I was not correct about this. Something might be wrong. And so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the coming one or should we look for another? So even this one that proclaimed yep. that the Messiah was coming, the Messiah was here, the kingdom is here, because the attendant circumstances didn't bear that out, that it was the kingdom that they expected, he too was wondering. That doesn't mean he was having a crisis of faith. It doesn't mean that he wasn't genuinely believing Jesus, his cousin. Uh, He was having some confusion as to what was anticipated. Um. They wanted to rid themselves of external conflict and the Roman rulership that was over them. That that was their expectation. Can, can we pause there for sure. a minute? Just be human for for a minute on that note and say, in some ways, like a, as Americans living in our day, and we, we joked about how it's troubling times and all. That's very very true, and we're just joking about. It. I mean, it's true, okay? But the reality is, we, we've had it pretty easy. Most of us in our, especially in our age group, you know, we didn't live through World War One, right. World War Two, things like that. So, all that to say, um, in some ways, it's hard to relate to what that would have felt like for a first-century Jewish person who had their whole history was of oppression and exile and all that they had been through. Plus, they were in this period of occupation. So, for a minute, just to be human with them and try to say, "Oh, yeah, I'm gonna sympathize mm-hmm. with what they were going through." It makes sense that they would. We, we need we want an end to this you know we, right. we see ourselves as being victimized here suffering and so yes very natural that they would be looking forward to and they had the very prophecies which uh you you met you read several of them during your message that talked about in detail God dealing with those surrounding nations and destroying the weapons of war and establishing this broad sense of peace so it makes perfect sense that they would have been anticipating and looking forward to that and really craving that wanting that. And the, the scene paints Anywhere that picture, right? Because they've got yep. the, the streets are lined with yep. people yep. and they're shouting and and there's there's uh, the imagery of of submission to this king and victory with the waving of the br- palm branches and shouts of save us now, all of that. So like they were very excited because of exactly what you're talking about, that they had dealt with that oppression and these hopes that seemed like so far in the future. And now we have what appears to be an authenticated Messiah. And so here he's coming in. He's like, all right, let's, let's, let's do this do thing. Let's do it. This is it. Yep. Um, yep. So it's totally understandable. Yep. Jesus came to bring peace. But during this first coming, a different kind of peace. There is a, 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 a day that we we believe very clearly from Scripture in which Jesus will come again, and he will put off opposing forces, and he will bring in this eternal, righteous rule of peace. That is something that we look forward to. But in the meantime, during his first coming, he came to bring a better peace. Yeah. A better because the, piece, the yeah, external a piece, piece, like those things yep. are are temporal. They they come and go. There's, it's it's relational on a on a a nation to nation 
standpoint or even, you know, having this righteous ruler among them, it, it's, it's not the same as the intimacy and peace that Jesus came to bring us with God himself. Yeah. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and what he did is he came in and offered himself, he is peace. And so I think one of the texts that that you reference here in in our discussion is is the the one I I did mention in the sermon is from Luke 19 in verses 41 and 42 it says when he Jesus approached Jerusalem he saw the city and wept over it saying if you had known in this day even you the things which make for peace but now they have been hidden from your eyes. Like things, what are these things that make for peace? Um, they didn't recognize it. There was something right. going on there. Right. Yeah. So they they understood peace on one level, and and at what it's not completely inaccurate, but something was missing in terms of the vertical perspective and the individual relationship with our Creator that was not clearly not front and center in in their list of priorities, or, or they didn't even see. That's why he uses the word blindness, and that's used throughout the Gospels to speak of those people who rejected their Messiah, they rejected Jesus, and even the crowds of people, probably some of the same people who were hailing him and crying out, Hosanna, blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord, may have been that some of those same people, less than a week later, are crying out, crucify him, because they had come to the conclusion that he was not who they wanted him to be, or that he was not offering the salvation, the save us now. He wasn't actually offering that kind of salvation that they were longing for, which speaks to this other matter of spiritual peace and the value of spiritual peace and how that is the prior, it is the prerequisite of any kind of lasting peace between individuals, between nations. The prerequisite is a vertical peace with God, but that was missed. That was misunderstood. That the prophecies were uh, misconstrued, maybe one way to say it. Um, another one that I think you, you referenced in your sermon is Psalm 118, which is quoted here in John's Gospel. But Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. One translation is, uh, do send success. So some of this has to do with what what was their view of prosperity? What was their view of success? So maybe a little bit more about that before we go into what it what it does look like to have a heart prepared. So what what was that prosperity success as they understood it? Maybe we've covered it a little bit, but what else can we say? Well, as I'm thinking about that, um, we all like sitting on our throne, and we like to rule our own little world, mm -hmm. right? Um, we like to set our own agenda, and we like to set all the pieces in order so they're just the way that we like them. Uh, we'd rather not have anyone, even, even God, disturb what we feel is the right agenda. So, like, we manage and rearrange things in certain ways so that we get our desired outcome that we think is good and right and best. And if anyone or anything, including God himself, rearranges that setting, we we, we feel like our um, success has been removed from us. It feels very uncomfortable. We don't like it. Um, none of us like illness and disability. Sometimes God sends illness and disability our way, and, and, and we find that to be an interruption in our plans. Um, we don't like financial trouble, and there are times that God specifically designs obstacles for us to relinquish control. It's like, oh, no, I, 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 this is what, I, what my view of, of, of the good life is. I have to have, you know, this these things lined up financially. I have to have these things lined up in from a from a physical wellness standpoint. Uh, we don't like when people don't love us on our own terms. And there are times that God allows who we are 
as sinners to, to negatively impact people that are closest to us, and it causes rifts, and like we don't like that. We want them to just love us as we are without uh, interruption. And so sometimes these interruptions show us where we really need peace, where we really need salvation. We need, we need salvation from us. The, the, the old uh, art cartoon strip, I think it was Pogo. Yeah. We have met the enemy. And the and enemy is us. Enemy is us. Yeah. And so yeah. we want everything out there. We want to, I want to fix your problems, Jeff, so that you're not a problem for me. And I want to fix Mike's problems, which is a very long pro, you yeah, know, process. Fix Mike's problems so they're not a problem with me. Uh, yeah, all day. <laughs> Listen, you, I live in a house give yourself too much credit. filled with sinners, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. I'm not going to say my wife is a sinner, but everyone knows like she, she's a human like the rest of us. Everyone except her. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you Be know, careful. Just keep going. Got, yep. my, got my own five, yeah. and 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 Isa and my wife. You know, no. now one of my five is is gone and married, and now he's got his own household that he they can do he's their still own. Close enough, though. He's around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But all all of these, I want to fix all these problems, yeah. right? But the really, my biggest problem is not what they bring to the mix. My biggest problem is right here, and God is allowed all of these people and circumstances, even illness and financial mm -hmm. woe and, and mm -hmm. social problems, political turmoil, all of these things to unearth my need to stop clutching onto the wrong things. See, that, that's so interesting and helpful. When we think of, you know, as we, as we think about the future and, okay, the, the coming of, of Jesus in the future— Yes, it is appropriate and natural to look forward to the deliverance that that will bring to us individually, to the world, for sure. Um, but when we look backwards and see his first coming, it's interesting. There's kind of an illustration of what you just talked about. Even in the the difference between those who were eventually crying out, crucify him, hmm. and for example, which, which by the way, some of those people were the... Old Testament scholars and lawyers and rabbis and Pharisees, and then you got the Sadducees, the other sort of uh, religious political group. They're crying out in that way. Jesus is a colossal disappointment at best for them. Really, he's, he's worse than that. He's a threat to them. And then you've got the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the ragamuffins or the, the lowlifes or whatever who, who just... The, the, we just looked at the story of the raising of Lazarus, you know, the, the simple people who were broken and suffering and on some level were seeing themselves as their biggest problem on some level. So, so that when they cried out Hosanna, whether they actually did or not, but so that when they had that kind of expression coming from the inner, their inner being, it was, God, I... I need you. I, I need you for me. I, I need you to rescue me. And, and boy, to, to know that you came, Jesus, for me, that you love me. Think of Zacchaeus, right? Like, you just couldn't believe Jesus. About, You're going to spend time with me. You're going to have lunch with me. Like, here's a, a very humble awareness of the undeservedness and this offer of God, God saying, I'm, I'm here to, to give myself to you. And we get ourselves into so many messes because fundamentally by nature, God is just not enough for us. We just don't value him that much. And some of that blindness, I think, is related to that. We don't we don't see, we don't have the proper uh, value system or uh, economics in our mind. And, and so God lovingly offers himself through Jesus to us and through his spirit even awakens us to, hey, this is the level of where you need deliverance, and, and Christ is that deliverance for you. That's that individual, vertical deliverance and rescue. So I think that's one of the reasons why, and I, I try to not just say this, I try to, to, to like embrace and believe this. God does us a favor in this life by allowing us to experience hardships because he helps us to stop grasping on and clutching onto this life 
he's it's like he's he's causing us to loosen our grip and say mm-hmm. there there's th- th- it's not here what what i need what really is satisfying and and sustaining is not the things that i have here there are glimpses and tastes of that which is great and good and healthy in friendships and in loving loving uh, intimate relationships and um, brotherhood and sisterhood in the church, and um, even even neighborly things that go on with you know between us and unbelievers. There are really good things that we taste in this life, but there are lots of distastes that help us to realize we were not created to live in this world forever. He's created us for something beyond this world, and so He does us favors by not helping us to treasure and and desire only what this life has to offer. Um, the best that this life has to offer kind of points us forward to what is to come. And so like I, I, I find it to be valuable that what God does and allows in our lives is is right and best. And and as we go through this life, we start to realize more and more that he can be trusted mm-hmm. with everything. Mm-hmm. That's the salvation and the peace that we that he's offering to us. You know, the, the main salvation he's offering us, right, is life eternally with him. But then the attendant ripple effects of that is that we're saved from ourselves and our own approaches and our own negative, inappropriate agendas, or those things that will be hurtful to us and others. He's saving us from those bit by bit in this mm-hmm. life because we're saying, okay, I see what that tastes like. I see what God tastes like yep. and the joy and peace that comes with that, and I see what my my agenda tastes like and the, the impact that it has not only on me but on those around me, and, and there's a shifting. Okay, my way is not... I can't be trusted. God's way, he, he can be trusted, even though it might be a, a painful process. It's it's toward good. Yeah, and that's that's a perfect setup. I won't go on and on about this, but um, it just makes me think of where we're going to be in the sermon series next week because of what Jesus says about unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. There's there's a kind of dying that God shepherds us through and disciplines us with, and that's that prying of the self-focused, prying of those that death grip that we hold on to things, and prying our hands off of those things of this world is is part of that deliverance and rescue and and, and yes, and so that's that's part of I think what we would say is while we don't deny that we are are called to look forward to His coming, and we know that we're we're, we're saved, that we've been appointed to salvation, and that includes from all of the the wrath and what God will will cause to happen in this world when He just puts an end to all of this mayhem, an end to human sin and hatred and warfare, and individually, collectively you know, international conflict. He's going to put an end to all that. And we, and it is appropriate to look forward to that, to long for that day. Uh, and I think, and, and as you and I have talked about this, our, our desire is that we help people understand and, 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 and experience God in the day-to-day, in the relational, in this humble awareness of, yeah, and the, the most significant part of the deliverance is that this Savior to whom I cry, Hosanna, save now. I mean, he is trustworthy in my life for with me and everything, including everything that I'm going through and whatever is going to be waiting for me in 2024 or beyond. You know, he's he's good. Um, and so what it looks like to be ready on some level, if if the first century folks seem to have this blindness that was maybe related to misplaced priorities, and that's what blinded them to the significance of his first coming, then I think that it's appropriate that we ask God to help us beware of the ten- tendency to make the same mistake, and just mm-hmm. to be humbly aware of, wow, yeah, it is truly the thing that we are invited to look forward to most, is that finally, what Paul talks about in Romans 7, the struggle of every day with the flesh and sin, and the wrestling with all the different hardships of life, and how our... Uh, you know, selfishness collides with all those circumstances. 
And Paul says, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So to know that, hey, that kind of final deliverance is coming, and I, I think, I hope, and, and maybe this is where I'll punt to you and see what you think about this, I, I think and I hope that that can even equip us to maybe more lovingly, graciously communicate our hope to other people mm. versus just, well, bad things are coming for all you bad people out there, and uh, I'm glad I'm not stuck where you're stuck, you know? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So I, I think it really, what motivates us for the end? What is it that we're looking forward to? You know, so you, we asked, what does it not look like to be have a heart ready for our king? What does it look like? Um, I think the clearest I can conceive of it is think about seeing the God who laid down his life for you. We've, we read about him, and we've tasted, we believe, mm -hmm. but we're going to see this Jesus who humbled himself to be made a baby and in, in some ways entrapped himself in human body He's eternally existed as God, the, the Son, unencumbered, and he takes on a body and lives through the normal things that everyone lives through, laid his life down, was resurrected in a body. He sits at the right hand of God the Father in a body. That doesn't mean he's still not omnipresent. He's still everywhere but he is entrapped in this body forever for me. And one day I'm going to get to look at him. Think about like all the times that like, you know, a, a, your sports team wins a championship, right? And they have this parade. Yeah. It's exciting. And this, yeah, a, a million it's, people yeah. in Boston and they're watching yep. the duck boat go by and they catch a glimpse of, you know, Rob Gronkowski slamming a bear can on his head, right? And they're like, oh, I saw him. And then, you know, maybe he threw a football and you catch the football and you throw it back or whatever. Like that whole pandemonium of seeing your hero, like that's really cool. I think I find like that kind of gets my sports oh, yeah. enthusiasm Jesus moving. Yeah. Uh, like, like I think it's really cool. But who is Rob Gronkowski? Like he's a human being. He's made in God's image. Like I don't. I'm not meaning to denigrate him. But like he's nothing compared to my Savior. One day I'm going to see my Savior. He's the only hero I really have. He's the real hero, and I get to see him. Like that's what it's like to to look forward to the coming of the King. Like I get to see my Savior. He's he spoke the world into existence. He's holding it all together right now by the word of his power. And he's coming back and I get to see him. Yep. Like that, I, I can't wait. It, it's it's like there's nothing on earth that that gives me that it same even comes close. Exactly. Right? Yep. So yep. for my neighbor, that doesn't he doesn't taste that. But maybe, maybe if I'm tasting it. In, in reality, really tasting it, maybe he'll see the joy and the hope that's within me. Well, think about what we how we started the conversation, right? Like, it's clearly a difficult time in our country's history. Everybody is aware, to some extent, of the political conflict and tension. Everyone sort of senses it and feels it. And think of the hopelessness for so many people. Mm -hmm. And I think of what it says in First Peter, be, be ready. Mm -hmm. Be prepared to give an answer to those who ask you concerning the hope that is within you. And that's what you just described, that kind of hope that others don't have. Yeah. They don't have that kind of hope. And to be able to genuinely share that from a place that's not, um, hey, I'm doing the right things and you sh shame on you for not. Yeah. And it's like, no, th there's a God who cares about the suffering of your sin and your plight and this fallen world, and he's coming back. Yeah. And you know what's interesting, and this is kind of, it's a little bit of an aside, so make sure I Do turn it. right yeah. back. Go for it. Um, as believers, we see our own struggle with sin and doing what's right or not right. <laughs> like, we see the, 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 the challenge that we have. I should not look at my neighbor or coworker and think, well, you're doing the wrong thing. 
they do, they don't. How are they going to do the right thing? You know, in in those terms, how are they going to do that? They don't have the spirit of God in them. They're spiritually dead. Why am I expecting them to do something that's in alignment with God when they don't know Him? Like, my, I shouldn't be looking down on them. Like, oh, you know, you don't do the right thing. I should be loving them and say, they, you need, you need a deliverer. He's available for you like he's available for me. He saved me. He can save you. It's it's not this, you know, you're all doing the wrong thing stuff. It's they how can they do anything but that? Yeah, and and that's that's again just to root that even biblically clearly explicitly, you know that the first century folks, that's the way they felt with the finger pointing at the other nations and the Romans specifically. And look at their perversion and look at their 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 emperor and their worship of their emperor, you know, uh, their Caesar and all of that. Or sorry, that's Greek. Uh, their yeah, their emperor. Uh, so yeah. So anyway, so that that that's exactly right. Um, and I do think that it, it it helps us. I think that perspective helps us and grounds us and hopefully by God's grace humbles us and equips us to share that that hope with with other people. Uh, on, on level ground, as to say, hey, one beggar, as we've talked about before, one beggar tell another beggar where I found bread. And when there's a famine in the land, that's good news to share with someone. Mm-hmm. I would like to clarify one thing I just said yep. about our neighbors. Yep. So because when we're talking about right and wrong, and we're talking about maybe biblically oriented yep. things, one of the things that I, one of the concepts that I think can be misconstrued in in that conversation, and I think I just did it okay. inadvertently. Okay. Yep. Um, my neighbor can do good things. He can help his neighbor. He can shovel his friend's walkway when he's sick. He can bring his friend soup when he's sick. So when I say they can't do the right thing, what I mean is right from a from a spiritual standpoint, right. well, not like, like that a, he can't yeah. do anything good. It's a great clarification. Th- th- there are yeah. people so maybe some all of these over the globe. religious categories or moral categories yes, that we might exactly. Right? But so there are people yeah. all over the globe that are doing good things, yep. and Absolutely. part of that is because every one of the people, all eight billion people on the earth, are made in the image of God, and there are ways in which that image of God does come through, even without a mm-hmm. person being regenerated. Mm-hmm. So, I just don't want to give. I've I've said those kinds of statements, made those kinds of statements before, and and not qualified. That's a really them, good. I think it's important. Yeah, that's a great footnote, and that's one of the beauties of podcasting. Uh, we can make those clarifications. That's great. So there's a great question before because you're about to do oh, that. And that's going to be fantastic. It's yeah, going to be ahead. great. Yep. But go there's ahead. a question you yep. have in here that I think I I, I want for us to talk about. Yep. Generally speaking, who were the people better prepared for Jesus' first coming? the Old Testament scholars and religious experts or the tax collectors and prostitutes? And then the question is, why so? And I, there's a text of Scripture, and it's related to what you preached on recently. Mm-hmm. Um, in Luke 7, there's this illustration, a historic account of a woman coming into Simon's house while Jesus was there and breaking a, a bottle of ointment, perfume, and rubbing it on his feet, etc. And Simon was very critical of this, like some of the disciples were. And it says in verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and of what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. I love what, what comes next. Jesus answered, or answering, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. <laughs> I want you to think about this, Simon, for a second. Yeah. Let's talk about this. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so he said, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender who had uh, two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, that's 500 days wages, and the other 50. So 500 days wages over 50 days wages. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. And then Jesus turned to the woman. 
He says, do you see this woman? I entered the house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time that I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. There it is. Think think about that. Yeah. Um, as we see ourselves as who we really are, desperate, needy, broken, God helps us to value ourselves less and value him more, to see him for who he is, to think, wow, God, you, you love me. Isn't that awesome? That's when Jesus says those who desire to save their lives end up losing, and those who lose their lives for my sake find it. There's the things like in seeing his value and turning my gaze off of my self-obsession and seeing his value, like that woman in that scene, the irony is that is the greatest healing and freedom that a soul can experience. That's salvation. That's rescue in that moment. So when we're looking for future rescue, it, it, it's the the ultimate final consummation of the rescue that we're mm-hmm. looking forward to. And that's an awesome, awesome thing. And boy, yeah, that just touches down those levels of uh, heart level uh, heart level worship and and valuing him. Um, okay, to keep that, because it's all going to fit with that, I want to read you this quote. Mm-hmm. You've probably heard it before, and if not, you maybe read it in the notes here, but C.S. Lewis was asked at one point about living his life in this fearful time when there were atomic bombs and nuclear weapons, right? And this is what his response was when asked about that. In light of how God has secured us in Christ, he said this, if we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things, praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. So something about that simplicity. What do you think of that quote? Oh, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, I think that's... When, when we have a confident expectation about what is to come, meaning hope, that's the biblical definition of hope, confident expectation yep. about what is to not come. Not just a wish, right? And as right. A, oh, this might happen, might yeah. not happen, I hope it does. When we have this confident expectation yep. that our lives are leading toward being in the presence of an all-satisfying, truly peaceful, abundantly joyful, merciful, loving, kind God. That is where we're headed. With all of the turmoil that can go on around us and even that which percolates from within us, it's all going to be absorbed and dismissed in that day when our savior comes or in this scenario you know world world explodes into <laughs> oblivion okay well that's that's the end but yeah. but what's on the other side that that yeah. that all satisfying god that we'll enjoy forever so let me be at ground zero please yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. guys i used to joke about that Get as close as possible. If I knew a nuke was coming, this kid is close to as possible. Exactly. Man. I don't want to live in the fallout period. I want to live right there. And, and just absent from the body, present with him, right? Hallelujah. We get to go home. So, oh, death, where is your sting, right? Because we're secured in Christ, forgiven, loved by Jesus. We have this amazing hope. And in the meantime, I'm, you know, my hope is for myself because, and I've admitted to you and in front of our church, you know, I, I'm a bit of a news junkie and, I, I just, my mind goes down these paths. I know we all are aware of what's going on in varying degrees, but for me, it's it can be a preoccupation. And at times that's healthy and appropriate. And at times it's it's too much or it's, I feel anxiety or frustration or whatever. 
And so even like a quote like that's a good reminder to me in light of the grand scheme of things, okay, there are things that God's put in front of me today. There are opportunities today to do the simple things, to, to do my job here at the church, to do other things that I have responsibility for in my home or with my kids or whatever. And and just to to leave those big things on the shoulders of, of God. Mm-hmm. And 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 I just want to say, and I, I know that there's a lot of interest and intrigue regarding the end times. And you know, are these news items are they specifically fulfilling prophecies? And and they may be, and 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 they may not be. There have been plenty who have come along and said, "Oh, this is this prophecy, and that's that prophecy," and they predicted based upon those fulfillments or apparent fulfillments that Jesus is coming back on this year at this time. And 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 they've been wrong. And and so we want to be careful about those presumptions and conclusions. But what we talked about today is just rock solid. There, there's no question right. about that in terms of that the deliverance we need and the deliverance that he's given us. And so in light of that, yeah, I think our encouragement would be to our audience and to to one another, hey, let's keep tending to what's in front of us and the good opportunities we have uh, with our families and people in the community and how can we be helpful, how can we do good, and and how can we uh, continue encouraging one another in this great hope that we have and sharing the hope with people who don't have any hope, right? Um any other thoughts on that yeah, from no, a sort of pastoral sort of standpoint? Yeah, I'd say continue to do, to, to, to live and to enjoy what God is doing, to trust him in the in the now. Again, our our plans get interrupted, the, our, our purposes and agendas get interrupted, but the one that is overseeing all of that is a good father, a shepherd who cares for us and knows what we need. He is trustworthy, so trust him in the now, continue to do your job and all of those great things while looking forward expectantly to the time when Jesus does bring in that overwhelming, universal, enduring peace that is coming. Uh, There's a lot to do, and there's a lot to look forward to. And we might get discouraged here and there. It's one of the reasons we have, first, to the greater extent, God's Spirit dwelling within us. Secondly, it's one of the reasons we have brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage each other. So it's going to be okay. Yeah, it's It's going to be be okay. Yep, it's going to be okay. All will be well. All is well in the sense that God is on his throne. We You said earlier we like to sit on our thrones, and we're not very good at it. (laughs) God's really good at it, and he has everything under control, and he allows very painful things and conflict and turmoil. There's always a redemptive outcome, and there's an ultimate redemption, a final redemption coming. So we have a great hope. Let's end on that note. That's a good place. Uh, if you would, close us in prayer, man. Let's might do, do it. That. All right. Father, you're good to us every day. We experience and taste uh, so much of the, the benefit you bring. We ask that you'd help us to taste and see more, to, to realize what you are up to in our lives. Help us not to be resistant to the changes, not resistant to the adversity, not resistant to the challenges, but to embrace your care in our lives, knowing that you are rooting out our trust in ourselves and fostering a growing trust in you. Help us to be a source of encouragement to each other while we wait. We pray that we would be able to look with great anticipation upon that day when our Savior returns and brings in, ushers in, eternal righteousness and peace forever. We commit these things to you. We pray for anyone that might even in this moment be struggling as they're pondering these things. First, help them to see who you are and believe. Uh, Secondly, we pray that you might Uh, issue forth peace for them. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 